Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. My name is Brad Stevens, your host today, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our guest, Mr. Charles Thomas, the Charlotte Program Director for the Knight Foundation. Uh, so happy to have you today, Charles. How are you? I'm doing great. It's, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course, I know uh, you, it's a Friday afternoon. I'm sure you've got big plans. It's a beautiful day out, so I thank you for taking the time uh, to be inside and on the phone this afternoon. It's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. Well, um, now you've been involved in a, a number of different kind of community change or uh, community development or just the work of creating better places, projects. Um, how would you kind of define what you're up to these days and the work that you do or that how you envision the work that's that you're doing? Sure. So um, I'm currently the program director for Knight Foundation in Charlotte. Uh, and so the way I would define my work is um, uh, prior to this role, I, I ran an incubator for social entrepreneurs um, and I, I, I was executive director of a nonprofit. Now I'm in a position where I'm a, a grant maker. And so my role is to um, uh, strategically invest in, in social ventures and uh, so uh, in programs that help to advance Charlotte. Uh, specifically around Knight Foundation's mission around um, creating a more informed and engaged um, community. Uh, so I've been in that role since uh, uh, February 2016, so we're a little over a year now. Uh, and I mean, in short, you know, my goal is to, um, uh, as a Charlatan, uh, is to continue to uh, to work to make our city um, a, a stronger community, to make it a more inclusive and equitable community. Uh, and um, in doing so, ensuring that um, we are um, engaging more citizens to be a part of the process for for advancing the city. Well, very good. And it's I think was part of what makes your story so interesting to me is the way that you've kind of worked at a very grassroots level. And then over time, you've been able to get more and more investment until now you're in this position with the uh, one of the most well thought of foundations in the country with an, a lot more resources than you've ever had before. How have you been able to kind of make your work translate or how has your vision, has your vision changed as you've gone through those different steps? Wow. Um, yes. Um, probably don't have enough time to talk <laughs> about my past year and what I've learned. It has been tremendous learning um, on multiple levels as uh, from a professional development level um, as a leader, um, uh, as a social entrepreneur seeking to make um, positive change around people, planet, and profit, uh, and uh, and so I am this year. I I really uh, took time to put aside what I kind of what my vision was prior um, when I was running um, Queen City Forward, an incubator for social entrepreneurs, and just took a time just took time to kind of walk the streets, if you will, to kind of get a sense of what. Uh, were some of the big opportunities in Charlotte, the big challenges that we face. Um, and from that year, from this year of kind of listening and observing, uh, I came in with a real strong focus around entrepreneurship and, and understanding that entrepreneurs uh, solve really tough challenges, tough problems. And I love that uh, aspect, um, that, that grittiness of entrepreneurs and that innovation to, to recognizing that um, though we have a, a growing entrepreneurship community, we have a booming economy, um, a, grow, a city that's growing and bursting at the seams. We are, um, uh, we are, we have a good economy, yet um, the growth, and then we have a tremendous land development. So it, it's changed quite a bit since you mm. you were last year, uh, where the city is uh, there are cranes everywhere, mm. um, and at the same time we have a, a really big um, uh, gap in um, uh, wealth and poverty. Um, and we have a growing poverty uh, in our community. And so we um, uh, have recently, uh, through a Harvard study by Raj Chetty, uh, were placed at the bottom as it, as it relates to economic mobility. So if you're born mm -hmm. poor in Charlotte, your, your ability to rise to the next level um, is, is one of the worst um, among our peer cities. We're 50 out of 50. Uh, and that was a, a, a shock for me, a shock for civic leaders. And that study occurred about uh, four or five years ago. And since that time, a task force was formed and most recently a report was, was put out 
talking about the challenges we face and providing uh, recommendations for how we close that gap. And so one of the things that I'm interested in now as a result of that work is how do we build a more um, inclusive community, an equitable community that, um, that is able to leverage the development so that it, it, it stimulates economic mobility and economic opportunity. How might we use this, this incredible um, investment in real estate uh, and this growth to create systemic change so that more people are able to access um, opportunity and prosperity? And, and, and how might we grow the middle class in our, in our community? So these are, uh, uh, that, that's what grabbed me over the past year and where I'm landing specifically is around um, and, and what is in the wheelhouse of the Knight Foundation uh, is, you know, um, the work that we do in communities to foster, um, uh, to, to develop places, to develop open spaces and to bring people together. Because the challenges of economic opportunity and the challenges to economic mobility, one of the biggest challenges is segregated communities. Uh, and so in our history, we have built cities that have divided people now it's time to build cities that bring people together and um, um, actually um, propel and stimulate um, people climbing up the ladder of opportunity and prosperity. Hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's, this is really relevant up here in Roanoke because we just had a, uh, the newspaper ran a story and has been doing a series of conversations on segregation in the city and how difficult it is that our economic mobility is. Uh, I would guess in the same realm as Charlotte in terms of difficulty getting out. And I do, it was interesting to me as, as I was talking to you before we came on air, how I did not enjoy living in Charlotte. And I think that my wife worked for hands on Charlotte, which I'm sure you've run into at certain Uh times. Um, And so we, through that, I wind up volunteering all over the city and I was struck by the very real feeling of segregation there. And I, I wonder, you know, you're actively engaged in this work day in, day out. And I wonder uh, if you have any inkling of how we start to overcome what has become and what is becoming clear, one of the biggest issues for every major city in the country. Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, so one of my first experience with Knight Foundation um, was uh, about two or three years ago where I walked into a workshop where some architects from Copenhagen um, talked about um, how Copenhagen went from a very heavily congested car-centric city to a more bikeable, walkable, uh, more livable city um, with the community recognizing that um, we, in our, in our kind of previous era of design and development of cities, we built cities for cars. Uh, and so uh, now uh, with, you know, Kind of better information, better understanding. We have an opportunity to design our city so that they're for people, um, that it allows people to be um, safe in open spaces, allows them to walk the streets and interact with each other. We also have, you know, challenges around segregation, and I, I, I see it as an opportunity. I think we are more educated society. I, I'm not, you know, there's a lot we have to push through, so I'm not going to even uh, uh, say that it's uh, going to be easy. But um, with the advancement in information and social media, we now can see how uh, see that racism exists and that structural racism and institutional racism, which sometimes is invisible, uh, exists, and it continues to, to serve as a barrier for all of us. Uh, so uh, it's important to continue. So what we've been doing in Charlotte is there's new programs around how to dismantle racism. Uh, that uh, a lot of uh, civic and nonprofit leaders are going through, as well as city planners and I hope developers go through. And we look at how, yeah, again, knowing that public spaces are, are crucial for, for bringing people together um, and look at that to inform how we design our city. So it's not only designed for pedestrians, but it's designed for people to interact with each other and to have community. So we've made uh, so we've also made investments in activities like open streets and, and creating, activating um, abandoned places and spaces. Um, an area of town that you may or may not be familiar with is the historic West End, um, where Knight Foundation is helping with um, the development of the business corridor between Johnson C. Smith University and Johnson and Wales University, mm-hmm. uh, where there's a highway that cuts right, you know, cuts mm-hmm. the, the historically African-American neighborhood off from Center City. Uh, and we have an opportunity to, to look at how an area that's beginning to um, see uh, residential investment 
you know, how might we develop that community in a way that create keeps culture and community uh, and as, as well as uh, allows for affordable housing and mixed um, um, income neighborhoods, uh, which uh, hopefully will also impact the neighborhood school uh, so that it becomes a school that is um, uh, that Im- and that is improved um, and is of quality that everybody wants to be a part of. So it is we have big work ahead of us. I think it's so possible. Um, and it's interesting in some of the classes that I've taken around um, uh, dismantling racism, we talked about the Great Depression. We talked about World War II and how that was a time where the government um, actively built um, uh, a white middle class, a middle class for um, white Americans, um, to the exclusion of African Americans and other communities. And so I feel like even though I, that, 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 that thinking about that gives me heartache, um, the GI Bill, the housing, federal um, housing administration and redlining and how those tools were used to, um, to deny opportunity for African Americans and, and other communities of color, yet it is an example of how it was used to build opportunity for a segment of our, com- mm-hmm. of our community. And so I wonder, like, why not um, think about it in that way? Let's think about those that are, you know, take, it, take it even, take off the racial lens of it, but think about those in, in the lowest income uh, areas and figure out how do we create, you know, better schools, better training, better opportunities to get them transitioned um, to a 21st century economy and continue to challenge those of us that are privileged, those of us that can opt out of, you know, bad schools, that can can buy into neighborhoods that, that where we can advance our um our, our wealth, those of us benefiting from housing um, tax credits, and that um, that we think about how we may leverage our privilege to help those who are not fully plugged into our system. So um, that's you know those are my big ideas, and and you know I think from my role we'll do our part in a way to demonstrate that, and in our and our goal is to, to create models that show. Uh, and inform people and engage people in the possibility of creating more inclusive uh, communities. Hmm. I think that's that's so powerful, and it really what comes out to me is just my immediate reaction is that I feel like it's really hard on the levels, the higher levels, to think big in our society right now. And so I wonder, you know, these are big things we're talking about. The you know, the way that they had to act and the depression to counteract these and to create that middle class. That was a, a big thing that I have trouble imagining in our day and age. How do you think we have to go about creating, uh, I don't know if it's the imaginative capacity or the political will or, or just the capacity to think in a, in a big way uh, and be ambitious about these issues? How do we even have those conversations now? Sure. I mean, I, I think about it in small ways and big ways. Um, so um, what I've been impressed with with Knight Foundation is Knight Foundation is, is all about um, innovation um, and, and getting folks to think differently outside of the box um, about change. And so um, Knight Foundation has, to, has had focus around journalism and the, and, and, and the shift to, the, to digital media um, to um, where we're, we're making investments in libraries and ensuring that libraries are creating innovative spaces that are welcoming for all and create opportunity for all. Uh, and then, you know, one small thing that we do is we do programs where we actually invest in um, taking leaders to other cities. We call, it, we call them study tours. We try to take them to different places um, that are with domestically within the United States and internationally to help them to see the possibilities of what they what they can do outside of their city and to then interact with leaders from all over the country as a part of a 25 to, to 40 co- um, group tour and to hear stories of how people are, are overcoming some of the challenges in their cities, which it's usually a lot of it is bureaucracy and political will. And then we challenge the, the groups that we take abroad on study tours to, to do a, a project, a, a demonstration project. Sometimes they're temporary projects to just show people like how you can have a bike lane and how it, it you know, and, and then we also invest in emerging leaders. So we invest in the civic innovators that are coming up that are not tied to the rules um, as much as our, our older community. And we give them resources to go and be disruptive. Um, and, uh, and so 
those are small, small ways that we can, that we are, are they're seeking to have a big difference. And we're very strategic in who we um, seek to influence. Uh, we also, the work that we're doing in Charlotte is I'm bringing in speakers into Charlotte that have worked with um, Mayor Bloomberg, that have worked in other cities where um, we had a speaker who was the transportation commissioner who helped to transform Times Square into a more open and, and um, accessible space. Uh, so that's how I'm chipping away at it. Um, and then there's, um, you know, working in Charlotte, specifically working with developers and city planners to think about, you know, um, how we might build our city uh, that in a way that is profitable, but also um, in the way that I see it, it is also supporting people and planning. Uh, and so that's that's my charge. Um, that's what excites me and gets me out of bed every day. Uh, I know it's a hard thing. Sometimes it does feel overwhelming, um, but this is a part of the evolution. This, in, in my mind, is a part of the evolution of, uh, of achieving the goals that we sought when we set down the ideals of, of this, of this uh, country and we set down the ideals of democracy. We know that it's imperfect. Um, we all have a chance to, to make it better, and that's why I think we're all put here. Um, and, um, and we do it, uh, and I do it in this way, and I honor those who are doing it. We also support artists. And so I, we uh, really appreciate artists and creatives that, again, continue to help us see and reflect um, where our opportunities and challenges are uh, and, and, and pushes us to think um, outside of um, in, in, in typical ways. Um, and I think the, the movements that are occurring um, for the rights of, 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 of individuals um, from various backgrounds I think it's helpful. Um, and I think, you know, all the friction that we're having is helping people to, to see that they need to, uh, they, they can do more than um, be upset at the TV, but that they can actually go to the voting booth, that they can move in the streets, that they can, you know, have their voice heard. Um, and, I, and I hope that we, we leverage this energy that we have right now to create changes that are systemic. Well, I know that your work all the way along, going back to your time with Queen City Forward, has been a lot about helping people that um, either don't feel like they have a voice or are, are operating in that place of frustration and helping them move beyond that into a place of, of action and entrepreneurship and, and creating change. How do you, uh, how do you, I think there are two steps to that I, I, in my mind. One is to, to motivate people to get involved and then another to empower people to take uh, control and to to become uh, that entrepreneur or give that entrepreneurial uh, thing a shot. How do you kind of uh, break that down, or is that how you see it as well? Oh, sure. Um, so there's a couple ways that we we approach what I call like um, the you know innovative thinking um, using methods and principles of human centered design or design thinking, um, where we um, work with either, you know, work with nonprofits or we work with individuals to think how, you know, to think in a way that entrepreneurs think. So to design and to ask the, learn how to write, ask the right question, learn how to understand who your customer really is, who the users are. And, and I, and I use this language and it's not just business language. It could be, you know, understanding your neighborhood. And this is what I was doing at Queen City Forward was actually taking principles of entrepreneurship and human and design thinking into neighborhoods to help neighborhoods think about how they, you know, design programs to engage their residents. Um, some uh, neighborhood associations would be upset with people not coming to meetings and think that, hey, you know what, our residents are not engaged. Well, that's not necessarily true. Sometimes people are engaged in different ways. And what a, a really good, you know, um, I think entrepreneur or design thinker does is they look and observe uh, how you know what's happening in the in the in the environment in the market um and, and they and they think about what the problem is and think about you know how to um uh, how to solve that problem um based upon you know how people are behaving and based upon some of the solutions that people have already discovered but have not become common practice um and so i've been very impressed with the work of groups like ido who are using human-centered design to solve social issues and I think that those, and that's what impressed me at Queen City Forward, that impresses the Knight Foundation. We're currently, um, we made an investment where we use these design thinking principles to help 
uh, a literacy initiative that's working to raise the third grade reading rate to work with a cohort of um, community readers and community organizers so that um, they, they use these principles to really engage parents and engage teachers uh, before they actually launch the solution. So creating prototypes and creating um, small examples of, um, of your product or your service before you take it to, uh, before you go too broad with it. And so I, there, I do believe that there are processes and principles that can be applied in the social sector that will help um, the social sector to be innovative with, with um, advancing new ideas and solving problems in our communities. And I think that can be used um, by entrepreneurs as well as by neighborhood leaders and neighborhood residents to think about how they might design their city and their lives. Their lives. Um, so in the historic West End, we actually used that as an opportunity. We had the Gale architects, who I mentioned before, work with neighborhood residents to redesign um, a, a, an, an, an empty field and to turn it into an outdoor um, African-American museum. Um, and um, uh, so teaching people how they can activate spaces and how they can be engaged in their community to create compelling um, places and spaces to be great placemakers um, is, is an opportunity. Um, and that's what's exciting about the work. We'd like to take a moment now to say thank you to our sponsors today. The Urban Affairs and Planning Program at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs offers an interdisciplinary approach to understanding planning and policy for mega regions, cities, suburbs, and rural regions in the U.S. and abroad. UAP faculty have expertise in urban planning, architecture, urban design, economics, geography, political science, law, technology, and engineering and provides students with a multifaceted understanding of how communities grow and change. Students apply their knowledge and professional skills by participating in real-world problem-solving with community clients through project-based studios and applied research. UAP emphasizes technical analysis and policy evaluation in approaching the complexities of modern communities. So big thanks today to the Urban Affairs and Planning Program down at Virginia Tech for being our sponsor. If you'd like to hear more, check them out online. But without further ado, we'll get back to today's guest. Thank you. I, so I'm going to, I think you, we've talked around some of this to some degree, but I'm intrigued in terms of one of the things we often hear at Expo is that we maybe spend too much time talking about bike claims or fun or artistic projects or talking about, uh, instead of talking about things like systemic racism or uh, structural inequalities in communities. Uh, but I, what I'm hearing from you is really that those things are all tied in together. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what that, what you think about that? Yeah, they, they are tied in. We, we brought this up when we had the Transportation Commissioner, uh, Jeanette Sadekhan, um in Charlotte, and someone asked that specific question about, you know, um, there, there's a couple of, there's another question that you haven't asked um, is around like um, sometimes this work uh, the, the question around gentrification, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes this, this placemaking work can lead to higher priced neighborhoods and does it really create that um, economic opportunity? And one of the answers that um, Jeanette shared was, you know, it's about, you know, when you create kind of the bike lanes and, and the walkability is about creating more safe spaces, more safe places and everybody um, uh, benefits from having a, a, a safe space and a safe place. I don't see, you know, at first I, you know, um, I do see, I think that it's a yes and proposition that, uh, that I am very, so it's interesting because I'm, I too get concerned about just talking about, about biking. Um, I think you have to talk about biking and equity, uh, and then, and not just talk about equity, but, um, you have to go, I am challenging myself to go deeper in what equity and inclusion really means. You know, it's not just about inviting people to sit at the table and you've like ch told them, hey, I got this table over here, come sit at this table. But it's also about, you know, walking the streets and going out and meeting people. And again, if the streets are not safe, it's hard to walk those streets. And so in the historic West End um, near Johnson C. Smith University, you know, when you talk, there is no bikeable streets. It's very, it's, there's sidewalks, but there are certain areas where the, the cars whiz around a main, uh, uh, an area of the, the district 
that literally should, in my mind, I say block it off. Make it so that more people are walking and that you have more people on the street, that they're interacting with each other, that they see each other, that they're, you know, they're, they're shopping um, side by side. Um, and so, uh, so I, I, I definitely can see where, and I think it's a great conflict and conversation to have. Um, but what I um, share with folks is um, be mindful of being upset with kind of bike lanes and, you know, cause that actually happened in Charlotte where um, during the sept, uh, close to the September protests, I think it was in August, right before the protests, um, folks were really upset that the city council was spending so much time talking about bike lanes when people were really trying to talk mm-hmm. about economic issues. And I think that's, again, it's a valid upset. Um, it's valid to be angry about that because there are, there are, you know, bike lanes are important, but there's schools and there's um, the way resources are allocated. That's really a challenge. And then, you know, that's not even getting into police and public safety. Um, and so I think people have a valid argument there, but I would be careful um, of, uh, you know, throwing everything out um, in, a, in a desire to um, get to equity. Um, I just think we just have to go deeper in the words that we use and understand what does it really mean to have a more inclusive community and what do we have to do systemically to make that happen? Um, and um, I'm an idealist um, around mixed income neighborhoods and I foresee that the mixed income communities would have all these amenities, you know, because a lot of these amenities, people, um, uh, it's almost as if uh, we, uh, um, there are certain amenities that the, the, the privileged communities have that we just take for granted and we don't even think about how we might create those in, in poor communities um, or how we might mix those up. Um, and I think it's just crucial that we don't think about, oh, well, biking is only for this community and it's not for um, lower income communities. And I think it's an opportunity. I think we all are wanting to benefit um, from having a place that is safe and that's walkable and that is thriving and have vibrancy. Uh, and and I, I'd hope that we can create more of those communities and disrupt um, high poverty pockets and disrupt high wealth pockets. Hmm. I, it's it's interesting because that, that issue of gentrification is very real as well. And it's uh, Roanoke is just starting to deal with that. Our cost of living has been historically so low here compared to everyone around us and still is um but we're just starting to have those sorts of questions pop up here and it's been interesting in terms of the um the city is now looking to invest in some of these historically uh underprivileged communities and what uh, what has been interesting is some of the pushback that those communities have given because they don't they no longer trust those institutions. As at least that I think is one reading of the of the situation. I wonder uh, if you could talk a little bit about how it is that we can go about building, either rebuilding that trust or how where you think that change should come from in, in situations where there are complex relationships all around. Yeah, I mean it's it's about um, how you do it, um, and so uh, I, I I think it's a process that. Um, uh, so in, in the historic West End, I mean, it's just it's 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 a challenge that we've seen firsthand, um, where we the uh, the partners are some institutional partners that are working to support the neighborhood, um, but community members don't feel fully engaged in the conversation. They don't trust. They they have been uh, denied, hurt um, by institutions. Uh, and so um, what is crucial is to have someone on the ground that is, li- you know, walking the neighborhood, living in the neighborhood, being a part of the community. Uh, that is, I think, moving at a pace that it's a really, the pacing is really interesting, um, where they're able to work with residents and, you know, um, help them understand the change and listen to residents to take that back to city planners to help city planners understand how the residents feel and what can and can't happen or what works or doesn't work. Um, uh, I've worked with um, the, the um, Alicia Osborne, who is uh, the director of the historic West End through a night grant. And I have heard her say, no, you can't do that in this neighborhood. <laughs> you just can't. No, don't even don't 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 do that. You know, and it's, it's only because of how it's being done. Um, and at the same time, I've heard her 
talk to residents and say, guys, this is this is how it works at the city. This is how we might have what we're seeking to do. We've we've got to all move mm-hmm. towards each other on it. Um, and so I, I'd I'd recommend to Roanoke that they they it, it's so what what can happen very quickly is that development and developers can get a hold of the of, of, of property and start building without thinking about it. That people think that oh it's a low cost neighborhood I can buy in I can buy a house, but I think it's really and I'm I'm looking to do this more in Charlotte is just think about you know when you buy that home and that property goes up. Think about who was there before and what we see is that once residents get in they go oh we want to keep the history once you have like uh folks that are from outside the neighborhood move in buy into the pro- neighborhood fix up the property then they want to maintain the prices and they want to maintain or they want to maintain the character of the neighborhood but our capitalism will take off and i do believe that there are ways to create you know whether it's historic de- historic designations or there are actually ways to try to maintain that but we, it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's a very much a community conversation. It's complex because I, I see the opportunities of where we want low income communities to welcome um, higher income individuals because that, that really helps the, with investment in the neighborhood, but yet to be done in a way that, it, that, that um, uh, appreciates the character of the neighborhood and also recognizes the wealth gap and the difference. And that requires allowing for affordable housing as you come in and creating. Um, and I'm learning this. I mean, I wish, you know, I, I often say in my year of being on the job that I wish I was in year five or year 10 so that I could have all the knowledge to apply right now. Um, and I'm learning all the different um, housing um, techniques and uh, government uh, uh, policies that can be used to help um, create that and reinforce um, those pieces. But I think we have those tools. We just have to be, we, we just have to talk about and put them on the table and talk about how to do it. And, um, and again, I know I'm, it's, it's easier said than done. It really is. And it requires patience. But people have to have the intentionality going into a neighborhood wanting to do that. Otherwise, the neighborhood gets taken over by the market forces. Um, and we design a neighborhood for profit, not for people or for planet. Hmm. Well, um, we, I think I mentioned before we went on the air that we're doing some action-oriented stuff with Expo this year, and we've just decided with our subcommittee on that that we're going to focus for this entire first year, I think at least, uh, on just doing engagement activities and trying our actions will be how can we engage differently with communities in a way that we hear different voices and hear different things. So I'm uh, I really appreciate it. we've a number of the folks that we've had on the podcast have, have mentioned the same kind of refrain. So I really appreciate hearing that again. But I do want to yeah. switch it up just a little bit and ask you. Uh, I know that you're a photographer as well, and I wondered if you could. Do you think that impacts your perspective on these things at all? Um. Uh. The, uh yes, it, it definitely does. From a place of it's interesting. I've I've had such a, a cool life of different experiences. I didn't go to school to be a photographer. Um, photography has been a way for me to express my appreciation for um, uh, uh, the African American community, for history, for culture, for heritage, um, as well as a way to um, talk about some of these things that um, uh, that we've been talking about today. Uh, so, um, it continues to, you know, kind of be a part of, um, kind of how I look at things in in terms of slowing things down and and how we frame things and how we can reframe things. Um, and, um, it, it, it's, and so I continue to use it, um, in, in my work, um, but just in a different way. Uh, and I had another thought, but it just, it just went poof. (laughs) <laughs> well, I threw you for a little bit of a loop there, so I apologize. But um, I, I'm also intrigued. I know that uh, when you came to talk here at Expo a few years ago, you th- there was a theme of kind of sacredness that you kind of referred to several times, and that was, uh, I think, very important to you. And I wonder, if uh, does that still ring true for you? And can you explain a little bit about what you mean uh, when you talk about sacredness in this work? Sure. Uh, uh, um, so... It's about having relationships. 
Um, it's about, um, like I said, taking time to recognize how do we have quality experiences with people? How do we have quality experiences in places and spaces? Um, that reminds us, that gets us to step um, a little bit away from the transactional nature of our cities. Um, our city, it, it, in every neighborhood, you know, even in neighborhoods that are um, nice, quote unquote, or uh, upper class neighborhoods, we're starting to lose uh, touch with one another. We're losing this sense of neighborliness. Um, and we're also losing a respect for um, nature and um, a, a respect for um, for what we have. I think some of the challenges that we have in, 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 um, in our city, in our country, is that we are a country that is so blessed that we have so much wealth that we can literally just, you know, kind of uh, waste it, um, be fat about it. Um, versus when I go to other countries like Europe, uh, uh, Japan, age, China, where they have become, maybe not China, they, where they've become more efficient with the resources that they have. Um, and, you know, here we have the luxury of, um, of, of, of kind of, 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 of having an overabundance. And as a result, I think it also means that we take for granted um, the, the sacred things, the, 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 the places and the spaces that, that make for, for uh, interactions that are based upon relationships and not just on transactions. When I came and spoke for City Expo um, a couple of years ago, I was talking about this idea of um, sacred economics and really the principles behind that concept um, uh, is around, in my mind, is around creating um, incentives where we are taking care of the planet, where we're taking care of each other versus incentives that have us over consume um, the planet. And, you know, um, and again, when we move more from a, a long-term uh, relational perspective, we, we slow things down and we see value in things that are beyond, uh, you know, uh, money. Um, and, and we are able to then tap into a greater abundance of assets and we break through the, the sense of uh, that, the, that win-lose that if you gain, it's taking away from me. And we're really struggling with, the, with that right now as a country where, you know, uh, America is, 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 is put on a path where we're, we, we isolate ourselves from the rest of the world, that by sharing with the rest of the world or caring for the planet like the rest of the world, it's as if it takes away from us. And it's just, it's not true, you know, and that being pushed by leadership and um, um, politically, um, which is uh, which is advantages just a few, is a is is uh, is a false reality that um, that I think that thinking about how we do things in a in a in a, in a more relationship based way in a more sacred way, we begin to say you know we can begin to kind of wake up from this like uh, this life based upon transaction and based upon fear uh, of not having enough. And we begin to see that we actually do have enough. We have more than enough. And that with that, um, there, the, the, there, there's no longer a fear with of the other um, and that we actually begin to see one another as brothers, mm-hmm. brothers and sisters. What an incredibly powerful perspective. I, I just wanted to bring that up because I think that for me, uh, I still, that, that vision that you've articulated there resonates really well with me. And I uh, thank you for sharing it again there. Um, as we kind of get towards the end here, I, I wonder if I, I can pose kind of a two-part question to you in terms of you've been working in communities for a long time now. So I wonder if you could share uh, both what you think the components of a place that works well are, or, or when you look at a place that's that you think is working well or growing, what that looks like, and then what's kind of the biggest thing you've learned through this time that you've spent working in these communities? Um, so I might start with the last question for uh, so the biggest learnings that I've had um, this past year is that it is it is complex. It's not as black and white as I want it to be sometimes that it's it's not uh, simple. Um, I also learned that um, uh, in an ideal world uh, and community, again, there would be room for how can I put this in a short way, a room for, for us to have um, deeper connections and relationships with one, with one another. 
And so, and, and you know, um, what we're working on in Charlotte is, you know, creating um, places and spaces that help people to to slow down and interact with each other, to build stronger um, relationships and social capital, so that and and ideally get to a place where. Uh, we're, we're not as divided by along these lines of race or income, but we see each other um, as a part of a community. And what the Opportunity Task Force that Charlotte um, convened and, and is, um, is leveraging right now is wishing is that everybody will, re will recognize that, you know, the children in our community belong to everybody. Uh, and so, you know, understanding that if one child is hurting over here because they, they lack resources, that ultimately hurts our, you know, uh, all families. And so, um, in you know, what we're seeking to do in, in building neighborhoods and communities that are inclusive, um, that feature mixed income amenities, is creating those opportunities for, for people to interact and rub against each other, to build increased neighborliness um, so that people recognize each other as first responders, as, you know, like we did in the old days. Mm -hmm versus relying on institutions and government to take care of um, relationships. <laughs> so um, getting back to the, those, those um, core um, elements um, uh, and values of, of what makes us all um, human, I think uh, can be the guiding point and the guiding principle that, that keeps us focused on what's, um, what we need uh, and will lead us to building ideal, um, you know, communities that are closer to the ideals that we, we all cherish. Well, I, I wonder if you could kind of if share a story that you think encapsulates uh, how best to do this work or what it means to be part of a community or, or something along those lines, something that's touched you uh, and you go back to again and again in your work. Woo. Um, you know, it, it's it's interesting. I, I have to like similar to when I did the City Expo um, talk. Uh, you know what's really helped me in this work is recognizing you know kind of the relationship I have inside of my family, uh, and I've had really wonderful experiences with raising my oldest son, where uh, I I learned that uh, you know uh, at I, I, you know, I went through some challenging situations and, and I, and I feel like I've succeeded and I thought it would be so simple to just share that path with my, um, my, my oldest son. And I've had to, along the way, realize that he is, he has a, he's different than who I am um, and that that's okay. And to accept him for who he is and to, to build a new way of talking to him and to guide him and to literally be a guide versus being someone that tells him what to do or direction. And I know this sounds good on paper, but when you're a parent and you think that you, that it's, it's a total shift in, um, in kind of thinking that you, you know, you thought you think you're liberal and then all of a sudden you just, you become conservative. And I think that's actually a good thing to help if we can all kind of look at our life experiences and see how we all share uh, similar uh, ups and downs if we can become more empathetic with one another. Uh, and that's what my oldest son has taught me is to, you know, step back and to accept individuals as who they are and, and my wife and our relationship and to then work in cooperation together. And it's a challenge. It is a big challenge, especially when you think you have the right answer. Uh, and I've also learned about righteousness. And that when people think they have the right answer, and it's because they think they have the right answer, it's not necessarily because they're bad people. So again, the maturity that we, uh, I think we all need in, in how we interact with each other and how we respond, how we, um, how we, um, uh, how, how we personally respond to the situations we have is crucial to continuing to be a more informed and engaged uh, society. Um, and, uh, and, and it's crucial to having a stronger uh, community and democracy. Hmm. Well, that's so powerful. And it's, uh, I hate to kind of end things there, but uh, for those of you all listening, if you'd like to hear Charles's talk from City Works Expo a few years ago, you can check it out on our website, cityworksexpo.com. Uh, and Charles, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate your, your candor and your 
uh, willingness to consider your thoughts and uh, as you talk about this past year and how you've grown, uh, it's really, uh, I don't like to call things inspirational, but I find it very inspiring how you've been, I, I can just hear how you're letting yourself grow and, and letting your thoughts evolve in this time. And I, I really appreciate that. And thank you for being willing to share that this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure, Brad. Thank you for asking some really good questions and uh, I'm, I'm thank you. And I'm glad to share. Um, and, um, I hope that it's helpful, but I'm so excited to hear about your leadership uh, with City, Ex City, City Expo, and I'm looking forward to um, future conversations uh, on stage at, at, in Roanoke, um, such a special place, um, but uh, I really do appreciate um, all the work that you're doing and that the Expo does to, um, to bring people together um, and to uh, foster um, uh, authentic change, so thank you so much for what you do. Well, thank you, Charles. You're far too kind, but thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast today. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and leave a rating. It really helps other people find out about our fascinating guests and find the information that we have to share. Lastly, please save the day for our upcoming event, October 5th through 7th in Roanoke, Virginia. And keep up to date by following us on Facebook and checking out our website, cityworksexpo.com. That's cityworksxpo.com. Thank you guys again and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.